Good afternoon, everybody. Um, let me uh, begin by thanking you for coming. And um, also by thanking Jim McArdle, uh, the Executive Vice President of EDC. This is Jim sitting here for having allowed us to use this wonderful room. Thank you, Jim, for agreeing to host this. Uh, we very much appreciate it. Um, the, just to briefly say, in Toronto, we spoke to a group of mainly business leaders from the Toronto business community, and it was hosted uh, at Gow Gowling's, the law firm. And then yesterday, at a big event in uh, Saskatoon, which was hosted by the Conference Board of Canada, uh, and we spoke at the dinner yesterday evening to about 120 people, and, and there were people from the government of Saskatchewan from the private sector, mainly oil and gas and mining, <clears throat> quite a few First Nations people, and people from the universities of Regina and, and, and Saskatoon. And then tomorrow we're speaking to the Conseil uh, des Relations Internationales de Montréal, uh, to the Quebec-based business community, and I understand that there's about 150 people who have registered for that event, mainly, as I said, from the, the business community. Um, when I approached um, uh, the Conference Board of Canada initially, and it was Glenn Hodgson and Diana Mackay, I was delighted, and I want to thank them, and Paul Fogus is here representing the Conference Board, because uh, they immediately responded positively to the idea of inviting uh, Aymond to come and speak in Canada, and I think they saw the value of this. And so we have partnered uh, in this endeavor in, in all four cities. And the conference board has been a wonderful partner in all of this and um, has been very, very supportive of this, uh, including at their major event, especially at their major event in Saskatoon uh, yesterday. Um, I, I'm not going to duplicate what Aman will be saying to you in a few moments, but I, what I briefly want to do is, is talk about the gen genesis of this and why we're doing this now, why we think it's important to do it now. Um, at NSI, and I think you all know NSI, I don't have to talk about the Institute, um, but we've been looking at a number of issues relating to growth and looking out at, at growth globally, the quantity versus the quality of growth especially, and some of the challenges that face uh, Canada, but also global business and the global community and the development process. And I was at a meeting of the Global Growth Dialogue in Europe early last year. And after that meeting, I went to a meeting in Geneva, and I went to visit the World Business Council. And they presented to me their new world vision for 2050. Um, and I was struck by the quality of the thinking around that vision, the future role of business, uh, and the, the strategy that the vision laid out for getting to that vision in 2050. And I remarked at the time to, to Ayman's colleagues that I, in, in 30 years at the World Bank and then working subsequently uh, as a consultant, I, I had never seen a, a vision quite as, as, as progressive, if I can use the term, uh, and as detailed in terms of how to get there from any international institution, including the UN, the World Bank, the International Finance Corporation, and not in Canada. And so I asked who did this? Who actually did this vision? Who prepared this thing? And I was told it was prepared by the CEOs of 29 of the world's largest multinational corporations. And the list included Boeing, ArcelorMittal, Pricewaterhouse, Sony, uh, Toyota, Volkswagen, Bayer Hauser. Uh, so some of the, the most important and consequential investors, global investors, who in many respects have been known for setting standards, both bad and good, uh, globally. Um, and what was striking about the list was that there wasn't a single Canadian company on that list. In addition, uh, there were an, an additional 200 companies that had signed up to that vision, 
global companies, major companies. And on that list, there was only one Canadian company, and that was Suncor. So I thought at the time, it, gee, we've, we've got to do something to get the Canadian business sector on board because this is clearly with the, these are heavyweight companies. They're putting out a vision like this. This is clearly terribly important, and they are going to be redefining the approach to global business. And uh, Iman will explain how they're doing this in, in, in much more detail. I returned to Canada and I happened to be at the Canadian Council of Chief Executives and talking to John Manley. And I talked to John about this and John had not heard about this. And uh, he invited me subsequent to that meeting uh, to the event Canada in the Pacific Century, uh, which took place a, a few weeks after I got back, at which there was a lot of discussion about the role of Canadian business and what was happening to Canadian business uh, and its relative competitiveness, if you will. And a number of people stood up, including, I might add, Paul Demarais from the Power Corporation, and talked about his concerns with the fact that the Canadian business community had become complacent because we were essentially blessed with the possibility of producing for the Canadian domestic market and for the US market with a bit going to Europe. And that therefore we weren't being sufficiently challenged and too many of our businesses uh, didn't feel comfortable or didn't know how to do business well in, in the global community, with certain exceptions, of course, the extractive sector, energy and, and um, financial services but a limited, relatively li limited number. And uh, so I talked to John about this as well, and he, he felt it was a good idea to, to bring somebody from uh, the World Business Council on Sustainable Development to Canada and to have this kind of a dialogue. So that really is at the genesis, in a sense. Now, the timing on this is important because, um, and, and Diana Carney is here, I'm going to, just mentioned that her husband, Mark Carney, a few weeks ago gave a very interesting talk at the Ivy School up in, at the University of Western Ontario where he, he talked about his concerns about Canadian competitiveness and what, what, what's happening to our trade figures and to our external balance. And there are some disturbing trends, although we're doing fine in certain respects with managing our budget, with a, a very low deficit, uh, on the trade side and on the external side, there are some worrying trends. And um, Mark, as I said, talked a bit about, about competitiveness. And also, in a, in a paper he did last year, put out a very interesting table. I've mentioned this to some of you, which, which struck me on the change in market share of exports of the G20 countries between the years 2000 and 2011. And uh, 12 of the G20 countries gained market share in terms of exports and eight lost market share. Not surprisingly, the biggest gainer was China with 170% gain in market share. Australia, about 60%. The biggest loser was the UK with about 40% loss. But not far behind was Canada with about 37% loss in market share and exports during that period. And that suggests that there are some justifiable concerns about how Canadian businesses are going to not only remain competitive in a rapidly changing world, but become, become a leader uh, and have more, for instance, Canadian companies uh, in that list of 29, or at least in the, in the list of 200. So we thought it was important to have Iman here, have the World Business Council on Sustainable Development, talking about how they view the global business economy as evolving and how uh, Canada and Canadian companies can not only remain competitive, but become leaders in, 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 in competing against uh, other uh, economies whose economic health depends very much on how they're connected to the rest of the world. So I will stop there. I think that's my 10 minutes. 
Uh, and uh, and Ayman, let me briefly introduce Ayman. He's had a, for somebody who looks so young, he's had a lengthy career. He spent a lot of it in Asia uh, with uh, TNT and with uh, International SOS uh, in China uh, and in Southeast Asia as well. And prior to that, worked for a number of years with McKinsey. Uh, and so with that, I'm on the floor is yours. Very good. Thank you. Same procedure on this microphone. Let's see if I can get this one to work. All right. With a Yes. No. <laughs> Will you get rid of the buzz one way or another? Not my phone. And now it's, now it's back on. Okay. Just have to stand like this. <laughs> I lived in China for years, so I can do that. <laughs> um, all right, good. Um, thank you very much, um, Conference Board, EDC, for hosting. Special thanks uh, to you, uh, Joe, because I'm, I'm actually, I mean, for me, this time zone works very well. I mean, getting up 4 o'clock in the morning means for me sleeping in till, mid till, till noon. So it's, it's actually not that bad. Um, uh, and it's uh, and it's and it's a real pleasure to uh, to travel around uh, Canada. So, um, I mean, it's just a gorgeous country, and the people everywhere are so friendly. So um, I'm very pleased to be here in your capital and and have a chance to uh, to speak to you uh, as well. Um, we've been speaking with with various audiences, and I, I find the debate very interesting. And so I'll, let me try to run through you know, my my speaker notes um, quickly and um, try to set up for a, for a debate. Um, um, so a little bit about me, I'm Dutch. I was born um, in, in a country that was rich with natural resources found in the 1950s. And that very, very slowly um, we've extracted or and still extracting from the ground. And um, not a single individual has really become massively rich out of finding those resources, but a country as a whole has invested in infrastructure and free education and free healthcare, et cetera. So in many ways, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a beneficiary of um, natural resources. So I'd be the last person to say that if you find gold in your, in your backyard, you shouldn't use it. You just have to be very, very careful on how you use it. As I said in Saskatoon last night is that um, between the person who wins the lottery and a person who loses uh, his legs uh, in a tragic accident, on average, the person who had the accident is happier a year down the road. And that's a, that's a tragic um, con uh, conclusion, but uh, unfortunately is, uh, is true because most people who win the lottery have absolutely no vision on what to do with the money. And so it all usually ends up in tears. So a country like Canada's that is so rich in natural resources and getting richer. I mean, almost everywhere where you start digging, uh, it gets richer. I think there's a, a real challenge. And so it's very important to talk about sustainable development here particularly. Um, a little bit about um, the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Uh, the council was founded 20 years ago, uh, right after the first um, uh, Rio conference, because businesses believe that they had to be um, uh, a contributor to the conversation that was at that time between governments and between NGOs and, and civil society. But the private sector, that was, um, I think, for many years kind of shunned upon as, well, they're, they're the people causing the trouble. Um, I think over the years, the realization has only grown that we, we, can, we can be a contributor to the problem, but we might as well also be a contributor to solutions. And so the tagline that we go by is business solutions for a sustainable world. And um, it's nearly 200 companies from um, many parts of the, of the world. We have 22 members in Japan. We have about 30 in the U.S. We have Western Europe very active and a growing uh, membership base in countries like China, India, 
uh, Indonesia, Thailand, and um, Brazil. And um, we do kind of two things. We work as a think tank where these companies work together. So don't, we don't really have that many researchers ourselves, but we have the people from the companies working together on greenhouse gas protocols, on measuring natural uh, capital impacts, on mobility for the future. And so it's really a place where companies collaborate on issues of sustainability. And it is then also an organization where we represent those companies at the climate conferences and at the United Nations, for instance, now also in the, uh, in the, the, goal, the conversations around the new sustainable development goals. And um, so those members fund our, um, our, uh, our organization and um, I get to represent, but of course there's a very wide range of companies. I mean, we have companies that are very, very progressive, very advanced, and then there's companies that are real learners and um, admit that they have a long way to go before they can really claim to be leaders in their, in their sectors or, or leaders of the, of the planet. Um, sustainability has been on the agenda, and I think we're really now past the state of raising awareness. If 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 you uh, if 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 a company doesn't publish a CSR report today, if it doesn't have integrate, if it hasn't integrated sustainability into its core strategy, it's really very far behind the curve. And um, but we also need to move from that phase of awareness into a phase of a lot more action and a lot more accountability. And I think the key message for today and kind of this week is that there are a growing number of large companies that want to commit to much more progress on in the near in the near term. Um, and that's because the overwhelming scientific evidence of the fact that humans are capable to destroy um, the Earth systems has, um, I think, has, uh, well, it, it's connected the dots, or we have connected the dots in our own brains. And um, I'm a business person. I only left business a year ago. I left Beijing with my family because we could no longer breathe. Two of my kids and my wife were on steroids, um, having lived in Beijing for only five months. And um, it was just not a, not a place. And so you kind of get it straight in your face when you when you live in a place like that. And when then we start digging deeper, you really see that the the evidence is is overwhelming. Um, we've gone over 400 ppm last week um, in CO2 emissions, and Greenland for the first year ever was melting on the entire surface last summer. And and so on the natural or on the environmental side, there's real cause for alarm. Shifting wet weather patterns. And, um, and, and, and potentially a collapse of, of systems, um, for instance, in ocean acidification. And so our organization works very closely together with scientists, um, particularly the ones in the Stockholm Brazilian Center uh, lately that inform us on, well, why are your priorities? And they use this framework of the planetary boundaries, kind of where, the, where do we go into the tipping points and, 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 and where do the ecosystems, where the systems that, can, that make up our planet um, and our safe operating space particularly. Um, I said yesterday in Saskatoon also that the planet will survive. It's humans that may not survive on this planet. And so that to me is my constant answer to the climate skeptics and say, well, it's, it's really not that I'm proclaiming that the planet will not, that Earth will not survive. It's humans that want to live in a safe operating space. If we go over 400 ppm, that's a space where we haven't been in the last 10 million years, or none of us were around, the planet will survive 600 ppm also. It will be um, biodiversity that will be significantly impacted Absolutely, it's not just humans as a species that will get into trouble, but humans have thrived in this kind of stable period um, for the last 10,000 years. And if we can, why would we risk getting out of, out of that simply because um, we didn't want to take the, the hard steps of changing our ways? Um, and I think the social tensions that are intimately connected 
um, to a lot of these, um, to a lot of the environmental problems, for instance, through water, uh, freshwater problems, or a lack of availability thereof, uh, as I said, pollution. And um, a lot of um, social tensions are really starting to creep into the, into the Western world. And therefore, I think a lot more people are starting to see this balance between environmental and social tensions. And so as companies, we, we have to live in, in a planet that works, but also in societies that can function. If you go to Spain today, 27% unemployment. You have 16 million people that need to make, need to earn the money for 44 million people living in the country. And that's a huge task, and it doesn't, uh, it doesn't look like that's going to get any, any better because it's particularly the younger people that cannot have access to jobs. And companies have to feel, and do feel, many of them do feel responsible for doing something about that. Um, and this is a risky slide to show in the capital of one of the world's most important nations, um, but we find that governments aren't leading, and it's, um, I think we're in many ways kind of trapped in the, in, the, in the democracy, which are just like businesses trapped in short-term cycles. Um, our government leaders, our political leaders, just like our business leaders, need to survive short-term, short-termism, um, elections, stay in power, um, just like business leaders need to survive the quarterly results. And it's therefore um, imperative that businesses and governments try to work together and create a vision for the future. And on top of that, both politicians and um, business leaders have very quickly lost trust from the, uh, from the population. Um, if I zoom in on business leaders, only 18% of people believe what CEOs say generally across the world. Now, 18%, that is very, very little, basically means whatever CEO says, um, people don't, tend not to trust um, him or her. And that's a real problem. Um, and I hardly ever meet a CEO who thinks that this applies to him or herself, but it's, um, it's, uh, it's, it's unfortunately, it's a reality. And I think sustainability, sustainable development is one of those places where that trust can hopefully be earned back. Um, on a positive note, business solutions are available. There's a lot of great work that is being done in collaboration with science, in collaboration with governments. There's an enormous amount of innovative power harnessed inside, uh, inside companies. And if you just see also over the last 20 years, all the things that have happened already and the technology, technological advances that have been made, I mean, it should also give us hope that, well, we can sit in despair, but we can also just say we can um, all get ourselves in the right direction, then there is probably a way that we can innovate ourselves out of the problem, but it can only be in that uh, collaboration between the various factions of society. Um, just an example of a technological advancement that this um, tool that was recently uh, recently developed allows consumers to get direct access to see where their the brands that they buy from, how they are using um, or how their suppliers are using the land across the globe. And um, so if, if I go to Ikea, I want to know that the, the table I buy or the chairs that I buy there, that they're sourced from sustainable, um, from sustainable forestry. And um, this tool allows you to have a direct view on to say, well, if this is my supplier, then they are sourcing from there. And you can literally, with GPS, keep track of where the where the where the forests come from that IKEA uses. And so transparency is one of the drivers for businesses to really start understanding that they can no longer hide behind nice rhetoric and and beautiful stories because consumers will know. And uh, I think the Bangladesh factory um, unfortunate stories of the last few weeks have made that only only very very clear. It's only hours after uh, such a tragic event that people know which brand was producing which products uh, there and, and the brands therefore start to take uh, much more responsibility. The response that Apple is having now, um, finally, after years of, of, of trouble with the, with the factories in, in China, 
is, uh, is again, an, another example of that. Um, so to that vision 2050, uh, in a complex world that where everything is interconnected and uh, everything is a little chaotic, it's, um, it's seen as, as, a, as a good way to say, well, let's agree at least on where we want to go. And then hopefully after, once we've agreed where we want to go, let's agree on a path towards that. And that's what these CEOs of these 29 companies that got together in 2010 really tried to do. And they said, well, let's set a day relatively far in the future, but a date that most of us will still be alive and that will probably be our grandchildren by that time who are in power in, in the positions that we currently hold. And what do we want the world to look like then? And then they came up with 9 billion people living well within the boundaries of the planet. Now that's a very broad statement. It's almost impossible to disagree with it. But they've broken that down into a um, into uh, nine pathways. And each of the pathways um, describe kind of what needs to happen in the next uh, 10 years, between 2010 at the time and 2020, and where do we want to end up? And I think the most interesting thing from this document is if you really read it, is it's, I mean, one, it is business saying it, but particularly what they say, they really pro proclaim a complete radical transformation from almost all human systems that we currently, that we currently know of. And so if you go into and if you look into a, a bit more detail uh, on people values and, and you can download this from our from our website. If you, so, I mean, it's 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 a busy slide, but it's it's really a, a good document to read. But you see, for instance, in um, in agriculture that we, 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 we're proclaiming that we want and in forestry, we want a complete recovery and regeneration. Uh, we want to have a, a, a revolution in the way we um, we produce our food. It's going to be a complete secure and low carbon energy, zero net energy buildings, and um, also taking a real responsibility for a number of the social problems in the world, which is really new that business leaders of large multinationals have come out and said that they feel responsible for those issues. And if you, um, I think the most important one to dive into a little bit deeper is the one on the upper right hand corner that says true value. And it's the, it's the, it should be the end result of the pathway that is on economy. And true value, um, the way it's described in the document, is um, almost a complete transformation of the capitalist system as we know it today. The way we business people have understood capitalism or have interpreted capitalism over the last uh, 30, 40 years is really this. Um, we get money, we put it into our businesses and we try to churn out more money. It's optimization of financial capital that is really the game that business plays. And um, that's a traditional view of, uh, of management and that's perfected through MBAs and uh, the McKinsey's that I come from, and that's really what everybody does. But if you, if you look into capitalism in its original form and you, um, you take that more fundamentally, you actually say, well, there's three forms of, of capital. Uh, and some people say there are six or seven, but I mean, in a simplified business, people can't remember more than three things at the same time. So um, three main uh, um, uh, buckets of capital, financial capital, and then natural capital, everything we get from Mother Earth, and then social capital, everything that we humans contribute and gain from, uh, from the system. And if you were to change capitalism and say, well, let's have a holistic view and let's try to optimize um, or at least balance those three, then you get into a completely new, um, into a new world. And the way to get there, if you read the document, the way to get there is particularly by changing the accounting rules. Um, I mean, we could look at that and say, well, we want people to be enlightened and we want people to, or business leaders to start rewrite their vision for their company and their, 
um, and, and the way they, they organize themselves. But a faster way would probably be to, um, to what we disclose as businesses, what we measure and what we are measured against to incorporate all that into, um, into, our, into our books. Um, because that's what business people are generally pretty good at is um, setting budgets and reporting, disclosing. That's kind of the, the nature of what we have. And so, but that means that we would need to attach a price to whatever comes from nature and whatever we give back to nature. So, for instance, a price on CO2, a price on nitrogen cycles, a price on waste. Not the waste that a company produces, but a waste that gets produced by the consumer who's then thrown away uh, a product. And it means on the social capital side that if a company chooses to produce, for instance, in Bangladesh, that it can no longer get away with saying, okay, well, here's my supplier rates, but how do I take care of the education that would need to come or the, the meeting the basic needs of the, of the communities that we, that we operate in? Now, that sounds like, well, that's pretty revolutionary. Um, but this is what our companies, about 45 of them at, uh, at, at the moment, um, are working together with um, the accounting standards boards, the SASB in the US, uh, Bloomberg in New York is very, very busy on it, and it's very much driven by the four big accounting firms that, in all honesty, sees also an enormous revenue opportunity for them for the next 15 to 20 years if this were to become a uh, reality. And so pricing in the externalities and driving to a completely different way of accounting. Um, a leader company in this is Puma that did something uh, pretty remarkable by um, saying, well, we're not going to wait until those rules are there. We're just going to try this system out. And so they created their own uh, environmental P&L. And they've taken a notional charge for all the natural capital that, that is used in their value chain, they're still working on their social, um, on their social P&L, but on the environmental P&L, they've taken notional charges, they've kind of come up with their own system, and they, in their own reporting, they went back from about $300 million profit to $180 million profit. And um, then they they looked at it and said, well, what's really the problem in our value chain? Um, and they discovered it was the use of leather. If Puma were to stop using any leather, the, um, no more slaughtering of cows, uh, the cows that produce, of course, an enormous amount of, of, or use a lot of land, produce an enormous amount of CO2, et cetera. And um, so it has led Puma to make the decision that by 2015 they will have no more leather in any of their products in their entire uh, in their entire world's operations. And so they're really out there trying to set the example for everybody else and saying it is possible because they they say that they could come back from the 180 million to about 300 million dollar profit if they um, if they if they eliminated that that leather. Now that change in, ta in um, uh, accounting system is really only possible because you would add, re add a real tax, but it's only possible if we were to completely revise our tax code as well and move from a labor-based tax to a resource-based tax system. And um, so particularly for policymakers, um, I mean, that idea has been around for years, but I think it is time that we really put that idea on the table because to add taxes to companies will be uh, very, very difficult to, uh, to sell, of course, but to change um, uh, from labor-based to resource-based is entirely possible. It is very hard for a number of industries, energy and mining in particular, and that's what I think for a Canadian company that is so heavily uh, dependent on, um, certainly in its exports, on, on resource-based, I think it is on natural resources and energy mining. I think it's very, very important that you as, a, as, as an economy and as policymakers and businesses are very, very engaged in this conversation because this is not too far out. This, is, this will happen in the next five to ten years. And it may entirely shift the um, the balance of the economy um, as we as we know it. Um, 
And so the work that we do today is called from Vision 2050 to Action 2020. We have these companies together. They work on an action plan for what do we really need to achieve because it's a very nice vision, but we haven't really gotten to a point yet where we say, well, this is the plan that we're working on collectively and this is how we get measured by it. Um, we launched this project three years ago and today if you ask me how much progress have your companies made, in all honesty, we don't really know. Um, I think, I mean, in generally, there's a, lot, there's a lot of good work done, but it's um, every, anybody's best guess. And so that's what we're trying to change um, in, this, in this new project, to really come up with a real action plan and measurement of progress with that. So I'll skip that slide. Um, so let me say a few things about Canada. Um, and I'm certainly not an expert, and, so, and, and I'm, I'm also not here to tell you why you should do on how you should um, run your, your country, how you run your economy. But I would just say that you've really put Canada literally on the map. If you go on at night, um, the Buckingham Formation is almost as radiant as Chicago is. And so what happens in Canada and what you do with your natural resources that have certainly been discovered has a serious, serious impact on everybody else and all the systems in the, in in the world, and that is um, uh, is an enormous responsibility, I think, on 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 the shoulders of the of the people and the businesses of Canada, and that's one of the reasons that we, as an organisation, would really like to engage, um, because that responsibility needs to be shared, just like we invite Chinese companies to join the debate and the Chinese government. Um, and so that's where I would kind of like to lead into um, a conversation. Um, so businesses are ready to put forward a vision, um, a vision that stands for pretty fundamental transformation. Businesses working on making that transformation actionable and, and something that is not pushed too far out, but really something that we can work on today. But... Um, we need a lot more um, engagement at national, local, regional, regional level. And so my question really is, say, what can we do or what can you do at Canadian level, working with businesses and governments and civil society to really contribute to creating solutions to uh, a lot of the problems that we face uh, or the challenges that we face in the world and also create a lot of opportunities out there. There's a lot of companies in the world that make an enormous amount of money out of these out of these challenges. I've just mentioned the accounting firms, but companies in clean tech, companies in biotech, companies in I mean, there's um, I mean, let me just mention a company is not even that far from here, 3M in um, in uh, uh, Minnesota, has grown its revenue every single year in the last 15 years has. Um, uh, increased its profitability every year and has in the last 15 years reduced its absolute emissions, so in absolute terms, by 75%. And that has just made enormous amount of good sense for them because it meant reducing their, um, their environmental footprint, but they have also reducing their cost and creating products that would sell better for their clients. And so there's not a business case for every company for a lot of companies, for a, for a company that basically um, works on coal-fired power plants, the, the future with a CO2 price that is a significant price, the future is bleak. And we need to talk about how we deal with that. But for an enormous amount of innovative companies um, and, and also traditional companies, there's a, there's a great future with um, a strong sustainability agenda. Thank you.